Hey, what's up, friends? Welcome to the podcast. I'm Paul Doherty, and I just want to say thank you for supporting this podcast. Thank you for getting the word out about it. Thank you for subscribing and sharing it with friends. You're literally helping us reach the world. We've got people listening, tuning in from all over across America and across the continents. So thank you so much. Also, to those who haven't subscribed yet, please do. Please share it with a friend. Leave us a good review on YouTube or Apple or Spotify. It continues to help us get the message out. All right, let's get right into this episode on the podcast. All right, welcome to the podcast. My name is Paul. I'm sitting with my friend Russell Johnson, and I'm so excited to sit with him. Uh, first off, thank you for listening to this, subscribing to this, sharing it with your friends. Russell, I remember when I first saw a clip of you preaching. Oh, no. <laughs> this was like two years ago. And I was like, who is this guy? I got to meet him. I got to know him. I got to get him to come to victory sometime. Because you were just preaching fire. And uh, and and since then, obviously, every like clip you post is just full of fire. But I was watching as your church was just taking off. Tell everyone a little bit of your story, like two-minute snapshot of who you are and what you pastor and maybe they're just the last, like what God's done in the last year or two. Yeah. Um, you know, I grew up in a ministry family, but found myself working full time in p- political work. I was a lobbyist and uh, chief of staff for, um, some different elected officials and really thought that that was what I'd do for the rest of my life. We were working on a big U S Senate campaign in Washington and the plan was obviously to win that race and then move uh, to Washington D.C. and work out of the. Um, and you're talking Washington State. Yeah, yeah, so Seattle we were, area. We were working on a Senate race there with the plan to move back to the East Coast, and um, man, raised a ton of money. I mean, I think the campaign did twenty or twenty-two million. Raised a ton of money. All the polling looked good. Came down to election day, we ended up losing. And then the Lord used that loss to trigger a series of events that led me to take a part-time gig as a young adult pastor at an Assembly of God church in the region. And, uh, you know, we started a young adult ministry with three kids and um, felt like, all right, just a little side gig. I don't know, just trying to explore what God would have for my life. Long story short, we had a move of God in that young adult ministry. We did that for three years. Revival broke out. Hundreds of people were coming. And uh, and three years in, uh, found out that uh, the lead pastor who I was working for was getting ready to retire, go into his next season of life, and felt like this was the Lord, you know, opening uh, a door for us to plant. And so I uh, had a conversation with them. We parted ways, ended up planting uh, about eight weeks after that initial conversation in a barn in a little city north of Seattle, about 45 minutes. And what year was that? And that was 10 years ago this September. So I understand you got a 10-year anniversary as well this week. And so, yeah, we're 10 years old this September. uh, And, you know, it was humble beginnings. It was like, it wasn't like one of those like Pinterest barns that you get married in. It was like, it was like a real barn uh, in like an agricultural (laughs) town. And you got a shirt to match that barn a little bit. I got the horses, horses, bro. bro. I got, we're country boys. I like Uh, that. I need a shirt like that. There was like people sat on hay bales. Like we didn't have money for That's chairs. Awesome. There was no like sending agency. We planted on a buddy's credit card. Come on. We bought a karaoke sound system from Guitar Center and we started a little church with 60 or 70 people. And, uh, you know, over the last 10 years, God's just been faithful. And it wasn't like an overnight success. You know, yeah. it was like we didn't have a building, we had a barn, we had no indoor plumbing, Come we on. had to rent in porta potties. People parked on the neighbor's grass. After service would end, we'd have to push cars out of the mud. Uh, we had to run extension cords to the neighbor's house to power the sound system. Like it was Bro, not I had cool. no clue of any of the yeah. story. <laughs> Everybody's was... been following you, it seems like, in the last year or two, and they don't know this story. Yeah, and I story. think, you know, people, they maybe they look at the conclusion of the process, but they don't understand, you know, some of the blood, sweat, and tears behind the scenes. 100%. And like how many times you wanted to give up, how many times you were like, does anybody care about this? Do I care about this? Does God care about this? Do I have what it takes? You know, people have asked me, how many times um, over the last decade have you wanted to quit? And I said, every Monday, you know, where you wake up and you just feel like, what are we doing? And um, even as the church began to grow, you know, uh, when we hit 200, you know, uh, 
somebody asked me, they said, what does it feel like to pastor a church of 200? I said, it feels like pastoring a church of 100, but with twice the problems, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like every time it would grow, then you would find yourself in or a headache. new season of like, I got to trust God. I don't know enough. We don't have enough. Where are we going to go? But God's been faithful. You know, we got three campuses now and, and it seems like really God's, God's doing what, something in the Northwest. What year did you feel like, boom, this thing is now uh, like you feel like you've turned a corner into three campuses. You have a building. What year was that? You know, where it really like began to turn the corner for us. Uh, we've only been multi-site the last few years. Uh, we was in a small city uh, north of Seattle called Snohomish. It's a farming town of 10,000 people. When people think Washington State, they're thinking like everything Seattle City, but there is a whole lot of Oklahoma country vibes Tons. in the I state mean, of Washington. Most of eastern Washington is all agriculture. You go north of Seattle, it's agriculture. You go south of Seattle, it's agriculture. So we started like in a in a farming town, and I still live in Snohomish. My wife and I do. I mean, it's a farming town. We live on five acres. Let's go. Uh, we have a tractor. Come like, on. We live in a farming town. Uh, but really, um, it was like, Six years in because we planted in 2014 and in 2020, this little, you know, thing called COVID hit. Yeah. And at that time, we were one location. We had just purchased the J.C. Penney department store in the town of Snohomish. Uh, total miracle how that even came together. We had just purchased it, but the church did not have the financial strength to purchase it. So we had to put up our house as collateral. So we put up our house as collateral. We move into the J.C. Penney. We're barely making the payments. We're just starting a remodel. COVID hits. And of course, especially in Washington with how progressive it is. I mean, everything is shut down except the strip clubs and the marijuana shops. But, yes. you know, the churches for sure have to be shut down. 100%. And But because of my political background, you know, the Lord used it because I'm like looking at this thing and I'm going, wait. So actually the government is making decisions in regards to the First Amendment based on ideological lines. Like, if you agree with progressive ideology, you can stay open, but God forbid you be a conservative or you be a church, you got to be closed. And I was like, nah, we ain't going to play that game. So we decided uh, very early on, you know, probably just like you guys, you know, when it first broke out, we don't know what we're dealing with. What is this? Everybody shut down. But we got into this thing a month or two, and I was like, whoa, 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 hold up. You can be open. You can light the city on fire. You can riot. You can be chaos, but the church can't gather. I was 100%. like, no, nah, we ain't going to do that. Yes. So we opened up, and um, on the Sunday, we opened up, half the church walked out. Uh, uh, just people who are like, you're a bad pastor. You're a bad shepherd. You're killing grandma, just whatever it was. And I go home that Sunday from church, and my wife goes, um, are we going to lose the house? Wow. And I was like, uh, yeah, we might. But yeah. we burn the ships. You can't yes. unring that bell. There's no going back. Yes. And so we would lose half the church overnight. But, you know, uh, A.W. Tozer said, he said, a scared world needs a fearless church. And yeah. I think a little courage goes a long way. And it would get week one. The attorney generals would come after us. The health district would come after us. They were threatening us with $10,000 a day fines, 90 days in jail. And I just said, you know, we're going to open and we're not backing down. And that's when our creative team started recording some of these videos where they were kind of capturing what we would call like public theology. Like how should we think about the world around us framed in a Christological worldview? And those began to get some traction and, and people showed up. And long story short, the church would double every quarter for two years straight. Let's go, bro. And then the Lord would put on my heart, like, man, we got to do something in Seattle. Yes. So we would buy a church that is right on Frat Row by the University of Washington, a former city church campus. Uh, and then in January of 24, uh, we would open up in the city of Kirkland, which is east of Seattle, in a 14-acre, 120,000 square foot, $40 million facility that Come on. Um, another miracle happened and the Lord allowed us to acquire. So, Bro, our stories are similar in the sense of how we handled COVID. Yeah. Because we had a similar vibe of every church in our city shut down. And I was like, no. Like Now, Oklahoma was different than Washington. We had a governor that was actually for us, but we had a mayor in our city that was very liberal, that yeah. was anti any church being open. And I, he threatened me. He was like, you know, but when he made a threat, the governor got, got my number, texted me and said, Pastor Paul, I love what you're doing. We got up on the roof. We did rooftop revivals. Wow, wow, and we wow, did wow. outdoor every week, like four services outside. 
Sean Foyt came. I love it. He gets on the roof with me. He's playing guitar. I'm preaching. We did an Easter production on the roof with Jesus on a cross. Wow, 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 wow. Thousands of people in the parking lot. And then we fed groceries. Um, and we got a call from the White House. Our first week, we run out of groceries. And all these business people start going, hey, we want to chip in. Wow. And our grocery giveaway, we ended up giving 16 million bags of groceries. It's crazy. Because Ivanka Trump, Farmers to Families, heard what we were doing and said, we will give you 10 million bags of groceries if you feed Oklahoma, Let's go. Arkansas, Kansas, Missouri, the Midwest. And so we became the hub. And people would come here, and we basically had this Dream Center in North Tulsa and then Victory in South Tulsa. But through all of that, as I'm listening to you, I'm like, there's so many similarities because the growth happened when we challenged the system of right. fear right? and that COVID spirit of fear. right? And that was like we lost people, but we gained so many more people than we lost. Right. Because people were looking for someone to take a stand right. to some of the insanity they were seeing of like, oh, liquor stores, cannabis right, shops, right, right, right. Walmart can be open, but the church can't. You well, know? and I think the reality is, is that people can't follow your voice until you find your voice. Yes. And for me, like that's what COVID did. Yes. Is it helped me like find it helped me find my voice. And like I feel like embarrassed to admit this, but really for the first like four and a half, five years of the church, like we didn't really have like a mission statement or a vision statement like i knew church was important and i knew there was a call of god on my life and i believe the church is the hope of the world light set on the hill for all men to see so let's plant the church but like three months before covid broke out the lord spoke to me and he said russell unless you crucify your need to be liked by people who don't share your values you will not survive what's coming next Boom. and i was like all right i don't that doesn't sound like an encouraging prophetic word but you know i'll do it and um, coming out of COVID, it was like I finally was able to synthesize in like a dialectical format, like like what I believed to be true about the, the church. And it was like for us, it came out as this. The church exists to glorify Jesus and in doing so, bring people into an encounter with his presence. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of things the church will do on top of that incredible things. We're going to reach the world. We're going to equip the saints. We're going to, you know, clothe the poor, feed the hungry, you name it. We're going to do it. We're going to start elementary schools and daycares yeah. and, and businesses and other nonprofits and global missions and all those types of things. But um, primarily, you know, according to the apostle Peter, the church exists to glorify Jesus because we are priests unto him. And for me, like, like selfishly, that was like the biggest blessing that COVID did in my life was it broke me down to what I would call my theological irreducible minimum. You know, like in the scientific world, they use that term irreducible minimum to describe an element that has been broken down to its base ingredient. It cannot be broken down anymore. And for me, like when I break down everything associated with the church, everything associated with what I'll give my life to, like it comes down to this core belief that the church exists to glorify Jesus. And for me, that carries within it just like you, a mandate. Like, mm. Yeah, I'm not saying that COVID isn't real. I'm not saying it's a government conspiracy. I mean, it might be. Who knows? But at the end of the day, the church has a mandate yeah. to glorify Jesus and in doing so, gather people in a corporate format to experience his presence. And I think for me, it was like when when, when I developed that resolve, I, I, I feel like I finally became the leader that God could trust with the people that he wanted to send. Yes. It was like, it was like God needed to develop that in me. You know, it was funny. When I was in Bible college— um, Where'd you go I, to Bible college? I went to a small Bible college in uh, the Northwest called Seattle Bible College. And where did you go to school? And uh, I th then I did my master's degree at um, Vanguard in Costa Mesa, the you, AG school. You have a vocabulary that I've never experienced <laughs> at this age. Like, you said synthetic, Christological, you, like— I'm just, I'm just a Experiment. <laughs> you nerd. said so many words that I, I'm, I'm messing up the words, but I'm like, this guy is smart. He is a scientist <laughs> of words. But I'm saying that because, uh, go back to what your story is, like you have to preach to a very intellectual audience out sure. in that Seattle area. And I'm like, God, Taylor made you to speak mm. to an intellectual community. Mm. Obviously, you know, other communities too like in Oklahoma right here. Let's go, baby. But your vocabulary is like, I'm like, this guy's got a lot of good words. 
you know, I grew up, my, my parents, like my parents was in ministry, uh, growing up, but, but mostly it was like, um, Christian ed, you know? And so they worked at, um, they were teachers. Yeah, they were teachers. And so we kind of grew up in that like world where they just really valued some of that intellectual development. And so I love that. Keep going with your story stuck. though. But I was, you, you know, I was in Bible something. college and one of my professors told me, he said, uh, I'll never forget. It. He said, uh, he said, ministries, um, Ministry is a walk in the park, but he said, "But what nobody else will ever tell you is that it's Jurassic Park." <laughs> yeah, and I was like, you know, people ask word. me like, "Oh, what's it?" You know, because we're getting ready to record uh, some documentary style stuff for like yes. our ten year anniversary. You know, yeah. So they're asking me the questions like, "What's it been like over the last ten years?" And I'm like, "Planting the church uh, has been both the best and the worst decision of my life." You yeah. know, because like it brings a level of fulfillment to walk in the God ordained call that's on your life. And then to see God by his grace, use you to help other people walk in their call. But it also has cost way more than I ever thought, you know? Yeah. Uh, but like Paul says, Paul says like, I labored in the grace more than all of you. Like there's a grace that God has applied uh, to our lives that, that enables us to, to labor and not grow weary. And so it's been this incredible journey of God just being super faithful. But it's funny, I think sometimes like in our lives, and, and I'm sure for you in a similar format, like like sometimes we look back over our lives and we're like, how could God ever use that season of politics? How could God ever use that season of education? Like it, it seems like they don't office? connect. I never did. You know, I thought but about it. But you lobbied for someone. Yeah, you know. You helped I, raise the money. And yeah, we that. lobbied. We raised money. We ran campaigns quite a bit. Um and who knows, maybe someday God turns that maybe into someday. when you're 60, you're the president of America. <laughs> yeah, let's go. <laughs> I'll vote for you. All right, man, I'll take it. Let's go. I know we don't know each other that well, but I'm like, I like this guy. I I believe in your word. I believe in your spirit. And I think that's like, that's the Holy Spirit that attracts like-minded faith guys that are mm. like, when you see faith, you're like, there's a magnetic pull of like, oh, this guy's carrying a spirit of faith to reach a generation that is confused and afraid. Yeah. And so you're doing an amazing job. And I appreciate you coming here, man, in the midst of your busy schedule. When is your 10-year anniversary? Yeah, it's uh, third week of September. Yeah, so it's coming up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're excited. Kids or no kids? Yeah, three kids. We got a 10-year-old, a 6-year-old, and a 3-year-old. Come on. And um, can't afford no more, so we done. But yeah. um, yeah, you know, my wife and I have been married 15 years. Uh, she's actually an immigrant from the nation of uh, Serbia. Her family came over during the Balkan War nice. in the year 2000. And then uh, we met uh, at church, you know, many years ago. And, in Snohomish. Uh, we I actually met right? at a church. Yeah, that's where our church is now. We actually met at a church in Everett, which is uh, where the big Boeing plant I is. Know where you Everett know? is, yeah. And so, I was just up in Washington last month on an exploring backpack trip. Oh, man. And my wife and our five kids, we road tripped. You brave. From Tulsa up there you and brave. then back down to Tulsa. You brave man. <laughs> In a suburban. Man. But Washington was gorgeous. We drove up to Fullingham. Bellingham? That, Bellingham. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we found um, Bellingham has this waterfall, like uh, something out of a movie, like this beautiful foresty mm. waterfall area right there near the border of Canada. And then we drove all through Washington. We found, of course, like Mount Rainier. There's this one place in Washington called Naked Falls. Oh, boy. Thank God that everyone was clothed when we went there because we had our kids. But we didn't realize I didn't I, I didn't put two and two together that it's called Naked Falls because people jump naked, naked into the falls. Wow. We might have to edit that out of YouTube. That's but a, that sounds no like one a, was doing that when we got there. Man, that's wild. That's a different type of church. man. A, everybody goes to church somewhere. You know, that's a different type of church. So, Well, let me ask you this, and then we'll go out there because Pastor Russell's here to preach at our revival nights. Um, what is the most ex- – like what sermon would you look back on this last year where you go, that was one of my favorite sermons or moments to address – the church at large through what you spoke. Because I watched a clip you spoke last year right when Hamas attacked Israel that just shook me. It was powerful. And I used parts of it when I talked to our church Mm. because it was so inspiring. But I've seen you address at certain moments in the last year, couple years, 
where you felt like the Lord gave you a word for the hour? Mm. If you looked back, what would that one be if you were to pick something? Yeah, I mean, I think maybe most recent, like, uh, you know, I mean, we're, we're a Pentecostal charismatic church. Uh, we believe in the move of, of God's spirit, uh, and we experience that quite a bit. But like two months ago, something unusual happened at our church that has not happened in the 10-year history. And I was actually preaching a sermon entitled uh, Our House is on Fire. And it was like, it was like a, it was honestly kind of like a sermon of lament a little bit, like just kind of grieved over some of the, you know, national scandals and different things that have happened in the body of Christ. And and people are imperfect, and people make mistakes, things of that nature. It wasn't to take shots at anybody, but it was just kind of like, uh, like judgment, repentance. That you know that that begins in the house of the Lord, and we need to return to, you know, the healthy fear and awe and wonder of who God is. If we lose sight of that, we've we we run the risk of becoming successful at things that don't matter, and. Um, I honestly like you know how there's some sermons you preach on a Sunday like you walk out of there and you're like yeah I got like I like I killed that one <laughs> I, I really didn't feel that way about this one I kind of like because I was really grieved you know heavy. so I kind of like heavy heavy you know it wasn't yeah. like you walked hey, out man, feeling heavy about it high five ten neighbors tell them you're glad to be here you know yeah, it was yeah. like please come back next Sunday I'll be in a better mood yeah. you know. So I preached this sermon. We're at the Kirkland campus, and I'm looking at the front row because my admin is sitting there, and she's giving me the look like you're out of time. you got to get off stage to get in the car to drive to the other campus because we do seven services across three campuses, and I preach five of them live. And so it's like a very tight turnaround schedule. So she's like, quit talking. Like, you got to get off stage. Like, she's giving me the look. So, like, I'm trying to, like, end the sermon. And, you know, like, you know, we just end like, hey, everybody stand. We're going to pray and blah, blah, blah. And and I'm just praying and even in my own mind feeling like ah that that I, I maybe hit a single or a double that wasn't a home run whatever is what it is so I get done praying and like I'm I'm thinking I'm gonna get off stage and head to the car to go to the other campus and God is my witness hundreds of people begin to run forward to the altar wow and like repentance travail breaks out in the room people just begin to get right with God uh, and not only do I not make the next service, the service goes so late, we barely make the evening service in Seattle, and it began six weeks of nightly spontaneous meetings with not really any type of like special type of thing. It was like worship team is going to be there. Russ might say something. He might not, but the church is open for people to seek the Lord, and I mean, we saw thousands of people Come on, flooding Jesus. to the church. Now think about it. It's wow. July yeah. in the Northwest. Yeah, everyone's on vacation. Now here in Oklahoma, you guys got the sun more than two months out of the year. You know, in the summers in the Northwest, you know, pastors, you know, we's all in the group chats. It's like, all right, everybody batting down to hatches. You know, it's summer. Like, yeah. well, we'll we'll see you back in, in September when people kind of get back in their schedule. And the church grew by 30%. People wow. are f- like people are flooding to the church to pray and to just get right with God. And then miracles started breaking out. People out of wheelchairs, healings, cancer disappearing, metal disappearing in people's body. I mean, crazy stuff. And it was really built off of this uh, message that I didn't feel was that good. But really, like like the fear of the Lord, which is the beginning of wisdom, returning to people's hearts and people feeling like if there was ever a time, Hosea 10, 12, it is now time to seek the Lord until he turns and rains righteousness upon us. Yeah. It is now time to seek the Lord. And it was like most nights I wouldn't get up and even say anything. It would just be worship and people at the altar. And I'm like, I don't know if I have anything for anybody tonight outside of a, a broken and contrite. But those are the things God can't ignore and will not deny and we just saw like a holy visitation. Um, so it was really precious, and it felt like God was kind of like like marking us, you Jesus. know, in that moment. Man, that's inspiring. That's powerful. Gets me excited for tonight. Yeah, gets me expectant for what God wants to do in His house and His church here and and worldwide. Well, man, I feel like we could go into an altar call right now. Just listening to that. 
Hey, stay tuned, and we're going to be uploading the message he preaches from Revival. You don't want to miss it. Follow him on social media. Follow Lindy if you listen to her podcast. Uh, We'll put both of those handles at the bottom here and Dino from the other day as well. Much love. We'll talk to you soon.